Hello, hello. Welcome, everyone. I'm starting to see people popping up into the webinar. Hello, Nathan, do you want to join me? All right. Hello. <laughs> hello. So nice to see you. Nice to see you again, too. Where are you calling from, Nathan? I'm in San Francisco in our hub here for PagerDuty um, in Soma. Nice. It's, lo it's lovely here today, so that's nice. I just came from New York where it was still cold, you know, in April. So nice to be here where it's warm. <laughs> for sure. The sunny state. Is it your biggest hub in San Francisco? Yeah, it is. It is uh, historically, um, but as I'm sure you'll, we'll get into, uh, our company, like most companies, have become much more distributed over the last couple of years. And so, um, you know, it's it's a curious question. There, there are times of changing. It could be, could not be, depending on the day, I guess. <laughs> your remote hub could be your biggest hub. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> I think we probably give another a couple of more minutes for people to join and then we dive in. Do you also have a space in New York? We don't. Yeah, our primary places on the East Coast are Atlanta and Toronto. So oh, really? yeah, and our Atlanta office is um, in a, like a really amazing building. I was actually just had the privilege of being there last week, which is why I was coming from the East Coast to the West Coast. That's true. That's true. You just opened the one in Atlanta? Or it was the no, real opinion? No, it's been for a few years. I think I was there just doing some assessment and stuff, trying to figure out, um, you know, what it, what it looks like, what the future looks like there. Yeah. Would you, uh, would you say it's correct to say that Atlanta is the Austin of the East Coast? I feel is like it? it's like that city outside of the main herbs that is getting a lot of traction recently. Yeah, and in fact, I went around and did some tours, did a real estate tour, like just going around and seeing all the things that, that people are doing and what's going on. And I was shocked at how much uh, work was being done, how much building is happening, uh, including 40 acres, 40 acres that Microsoft bought. I was like, they bought 40 wow. acres? In um, Atlanta, okay. Yeah, in Atlanta. And so, yeah, a lot of opportunities there and it's really growing really quickly. Um, and I know that there, you know, there's a big movement to those tech companies there, so. Yeah, really a lot of change, a lot of change there. Yeah, for sure. And then we don't know who's following who. Is it the companies following the people mm. or is it the people driving the changes to, toward the cities? Yeah, I mean, I think, we all, I think we all know it's a, it's a mix of both, right? But I mean, you know, as employees are like, oh, we get to take advantage of having more flexibility and then also having better cost of living and more comfort. Uh, it's gonna be really, you know, calling to them. Um, Brooke, our, our broker, our JL broker there in Atlanta, she was saying to me that, um, you know, that during the pandemic, they just really exploded because there was so much opportunity for businesses to come there and like be active. Uh, and so, yeah, yeah I, I, that was my experience being there last week was like, wow, it's really impressive how much yeah. is happening in Atlanta. It's gonna be very impressive to see um, kind of the new hubs, coming out of that mm -hmm. crisis, pandemic. Some of us call it an opportunity, so we don't know how we should call it, but it's true that like the, the, the traditional hub that we used to have like San Francisco and Singapore and Dublin are now being slightly replaced with Atlanta and Austin and maybe Mexico City. Uh, and they're emerging, they're growing, they're emerging. It'd be, it'd be interesting to see if they fully replace them in a little mm -hmm. while. Yeah, no, completely, completely agree. I've, I've wondered more if it's just going to have uh, few, we're just going to have a lot more, right? They're all going to be smaller, but there's just going to be a lot more of them. Um, but I was just talking to, to someone in New York uh, and they were talking about how in the brokerage business in New York specifically, now all of a sudden, instead of doing like uh, two really big deals a year, you may do 10 medium-sized deals a year or something like that, right? And so it, it reminds us that, oh, there are all of these people who have always wanted to be in New York City or be in San Francisco or whatever. And now all of a sudden, now that there's been more vacancy and there's been more churn, like suddenly they have an opportunity to be there. So yeah, we'll see. Yeah, it does. It does feel, definitely in San Francisco, it was almost like a room of, or like giving some air to this Space that was so clustered and like as you were saying like many companies couldn't have a have a space in San Francisco because it was very expensive even employees themselves couldn't find a spot yep. to live there and mm -hmm. so suddenly by 
that's exodus outside of the city from a portion of people that allowed the price to decrease and then yeah and then creating that like turnover that is healthy for any environment mm -hmm. yeah great i think we're gonna we already jumped in but i think we should officially start so welcome everybody um nathan i'll let you introduce yourself but i just want to say that I'm really glad that you are with us today talking about this important topic of the movement of workplaces to fit into the hybrid model and how data can help transforming those workplaces so they remain relevant to our audience who are the employees. So Nathan, the mic is on you. Please give us two lines on you. Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Nathan Manuel, uh, and I work at the workplace team here at PagerDuty. And you know, I think that I have a long history of uh, being in the workplace environment from a bunch of different aspects. And so that comes down to like coming in the side door through IT, uh, really being focused on furniture and design, and now really like bringing all of the worlds and all of my like work history together uh, in a time when I think it's needed most and there's so much change happening and it's really an exciting time for people in the workplace environment. So um, yeah, that's me. And I'm sure we're gonna get into more about me like throughout this time. There was something that um, you said when we were doing kind of like the introduction was that you used to design furniture that was not functional. And mm -hmm. that got me so interested because right now that's the question we're asking ourselves. How can we make the office functional? Should it be functional or should it look like a private club or a clubhouse? Uh -huh. What was your background playing around and tweaking with, with design itself? Sure. So um, yeah, I went to the Corcoran College of Art and Design in Washington, D.C., and then I uh, got an MFA in sculpture uh, from the School of Visual Arts after that. So when we say that uh, that was part of my life, it really was uh, like it, that was my primary focus for many years. I was just thinking about um, how we would uh, think about uh, design or uh, sculpture in a space. And so as I went through that process, uh, specifically during my MFA, I you know, built a lot of chairs and uh, tops of houses in my studio, all sorts of things, thinking about the ways to like change what those things look like. And you're right, a lot of that work was focused on uh, taking something that had a very defined function and removing its function. And so I made chairs that were too small for you to sit in, like there wasn't actually enough seat space, things like that. But really what that has like transformed into is um, a great understanding of then like, okay, then what's actually needed, what looks good. And so I'll give you an example for what's happening in our spaces. Um, you know, we've become uh, much more thoughtful about our spaces, even when we have a traditional lease or a real estate, uh, you know, in, a, in a real estate terms, uh, we think about those spaces being much more like a co-working space. And we've already learned that the spaces are way more binary, right? So when we're designing for them, exactly what you're suggesting, like, well, do we design for it to be a collaboration space or an event space? Because those are much more the things that people are coming in for. It's not coming in to do individual work or set at a desk. And so since we know the office is gonna have 10 people or 150 people and 10 people and 150 people, let's design with that in mind. And so, um, you know, that's what we've been doing and that's what we're looking to use density to help us make decisions on moving forward. I love that really the focus was on function because that's definitely something that has been smashed by the last two years is that the primary function of the office to be a place of work is almost no longer at all to be a place to work is a place to like mm. meet the other colleagues be part of the community collaborate but somehow it's not the individual work as you said but it's more the like collective work and that collective can be like being like reminded of what's the company mission, going to like a TED talk mm -hmm. from the from the founder. So by using data, as you said, you I'm sure are transforming the spaces into different various functions. Mm -hmm. What are those? How did you explore them? I, I will answer your question, but I'm going to interject quickly and say that the only data that mattered before was how many bodies could I fit into the square footage that we had? And it was like how to maximize, right? And that was the goal. That was the piece of data everybody was looking for at all times. Like, okay, what's the dollar per square foot? How many bodies can I fit in that square footage? Um, those were the things. Exactly. 
Right. And, and, and we were, you... and fortunately, we were came in and they were so low on giving per person that we were considered like luxurious by giving 125 per person. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I had a, I had a 150 square feet model, including conference rooms, and that was definitely considered luxurious. And then I remember Sorry. doing a project in Japan and they were like, uh, no, 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 85. And I was like, <laughs> right, got it. Um, <laughs> But to answer your actual question, what are, what are the things that we're building towards or what are the different types of functions that we're building uh, today? It, you know, it's pretty drastically different. So a couple of different things I would suggest that we're experimenting with would be things like um, open space conference rooms. It was something that would have never flown in the past, but it's something that we're trying out today. We know about the audio issues. We know that it's creating sound throughout the space. But one of the things I would say is it increases comfort level and it has provided an opportunity for um, you know, when the space is not so full, when it's on the other end of that binary, that people can use those spaces pretty freely, even if it's for casual chats or kind of um, casual collisions, kind of water cooler moments, things like that. But then I would also say uh, the things that are really calling people back in, right, are uh, trainings, uh, times where there need to be whiteboarding. There, that's true kind of true collaboration What we think about that. Yes, we all know that you can use Moreau or things, tools that we have available to us to do that. But sometimes there are moments where it's, you know, the call is we really want to be able to do this in person. And Nelly, I'm sure you've seen this, and I've been maybe most surprised by the people who want to be in the office. I thought for sure younger people would be like, no, I never want to go back to the office. And then it's in fact, in fact, has become the exact opposite. So often young salespeople or people who are earlier in their career, they're looking for opportunities to develop their skills and strengths. Um, network and develop their skills with their mentors and their superiors in the company, things like that, whatever those things are, right? And so it's like, okay, how do you come to a place where it's like you bring all of these things that you thought you knew together with what's actually happening? And so those are the kinds of spaces that we're building out now. Um, and I would just say too, you know, we, we went in this office specifically, we went from 440 desks, 420 desks, something like that to 150 desks. Um, and suddenly when you remove all of this desking and you move away from the maximizing uh, kind of mentality that we were talking about a while ago, how do we fit maximum bodies into a space? And you start to say, okay, now I've removed 300 desks, what can I do? Suddenly you realize like you have so much space to do so many more interesting things with. And so now the middle of our office has a cafe in it, for instance, um, and it has banquette seating right in the middle of our, our space. And we were really able to redesign and rethink. Um, and we know that if we give people uh, a different configuration, we'll get a different set of outcomes rather than them being able to fall back into directly uh, their old habits uh, because the, the space as it was isn't there for them to fall into those old habits. Exactly. And habit is a big part of why people are not coming back in a second is that they've have they've they've adopted new habits over the last two years and it's hard to break away from habit usually it takes like 30 days to learn a new habit and now it's like <laughs> 500 days maybe we into this and so it's interesting that somehow is giving more function to the office you also give um uh like an intention towards it because i remember as i was designing offices before the pandemic it was mostly desk, as you said, and then here and there, we were trying to put a whiteboard or we had this meeting room and we had maybe one coffee, one like big dining hall, but then it was not clear like where you should go when you want to be loud, where you should go when you want to be quiet because your desk was always at the same spot. And so unfortunately, if you were sitting next to someone who was very loud, you would choose to stay at home that day because you wanted some quiet time. Whereas now you could go to, into the office because you know exactly what space will fit what it's on your agenda for the day. And as we can see, our agenda is fluctuating during the day. I can have like a need for focus time in the morning. Then I want to be social. Then I want to be to a training. And all of this can be like at hand in an office that has proper function in different areas. Mm -hmm. I have a question for you. As you said, you were transitioning toward a lot less desk. Um, did you use data to inform how many days you would leave at the end or how was that thought process? Sure. So we actually went through a rather long uh, process and we worked with the JLL workplace team 
um, to come do uh, analysis of our teams internally. Uh, and we went through a really long process with them. And it included all sorts of things, as you can guess, interviews, uh, checking data for actual uh, visitation to spaces. That included things like you know, badge readers and everything else, all of the traditional ways that you would think about doing that. Um, but one of the things that we were really looking towards too was, okay, let's, let's understand what our peak days are going to be when we have those largest events and then understand in those situations, it doesn't require that everybody have a desk. And one of the things I think we've come to very quickly is that when all of those people come to be in collaboration spaces and we have our, our office broken down into seven distinct zones and those zones may include some desking and multiple conference rooms, things like that, is that when they come into those zones, very little of their time is actually spent at those desks, even when they're here. So the idea that there's a need for a one-to-one -one ratio for desking isn't very uh, honest uh, in regards to how people are actually using the space. And if they're coming in for an event or a training or collaboration session, they really are coming in for those things, not because they're coming, they may come in for lunch too, uh, but, but outside of that, uh, they're not really coming in to uh, like just sit at a desk and have that. So yeah, we, we've found that it's not really quite as necessary. There's been, um, from what I've seen in the industry, there's been almost two paths either the path that you've taken which is creating zones for with different function and different purpose and there was the other path who had started a little before the pandemic and had continued through was giving neighborhoods to teams did you consider the two options how did you choose the one you chose hmm. so we did of course consider that and i'm going to say uh we haven't come to a conclusion so i suspect that even within the solutions, there will be some hybridization of what it looks like moving forward. And I could see a situation where we uh, keep the different zones that we have today, but maybe one of the zones will be reduced. And we will find that there are specific teams that do need uh, fixed desks, or maybe there are certain types of employees that um, you know want different kinds of experiences. And we think about things like uh, neurodiverse audiences or something like that. When you start to get into these other concepts and start to really be uh, thoughtful about what inclusion would look like, it suddenly goes, okay, well, maybe we need to have flexibility and experiment with this and experiment with this. And, or maybe there are just certain roles, uh, you know, that say like, oh, I really need to have a desk with a printer and a shredder or whatever. Like I think about accountants or, and I can see those people. And so I suspect we haven't come to a firm uh, conclusion of what it's going to look like. I think it's going to look more like something that is uh, a mix of all of those things. And there will probably be a very small percentage of the desks that are fixed and then a bunch of hoteling and then uh, zones that live outside of the neighborhood. So it's going to be both the zones and the neighborhoods eventually is, what I, is, my, is my prediction. And because I hear then that it would be iteration happening have you found the need to also find solutions on the furniture side and maybe on the partition to also accommodate that fast iteration absolutely and i would say we have not nailed it right now so uh you know th th sometimes you have to learn things the hard way even after you spend some money and do some things and pretty quickly sometimes you realize that maybe that wasn't the absolute best solution. So we have some good solutions. We have some things that are like um, uh, space store uh, dividing walls that help us do some work, but those are great, like a furniture solution. We also have zoned off some of our space with planters. And so some of those planters are um, you know, used as dividing walls. Uh, you know, we also have traditional conference rooms and training rooms and other spaces that do those things. But the answer is, Yes, we know that there needs to be some flexibility. We know that some of these solutions are, are going to be temporary, but then we also know that we have great success in some things. Like, you know, I, I think we both have heard this complaint about like, oh, I came into the office and spent half my day in a frame booth because I needed to be on Zoom calls with people who aren't in the office. Like I get, I get the frustration of like having to commute to do that on some level. I do understand that. But man, the, the success of the frame booth or the phone booth on the other end of that is so high, right? Like it's clearly doing its job very well because we end up spending, we end up having people like really use them and enjoy them, but also they just function at a really high level. And so, you know, even though I, I do get the complaint, I wouldn't want to commute to come and sit in a frame for, for four hours either, but 
at the same time, I think that some of these things are working well and some aren't. And yes, a lot of iteration. And look, we're, we know that over the coming year or two, uh, especially the workplace world is going to have a ton of iteration and we're all gonna get to learn from each other's uh, successes and failures. Yeah, and I couldn't agree more. I think like the changes is touching everybody. And so you are the decision makers, but you need the suppliers to also come with innovation. So it can be aligned with like that past iteration that we're going through or that maybe new model that will come. I think we, we mm -hmm. still have a brand for the open floor plan. We don't have a branding name yet for that hybrid model that is changing, that is checking with employees often that is also reviewing data to make sure we have the right space there should be a brand coming a branding name coming out of it but yeah like solution providers need to also be there to like accompany us into that innovation path mm -hmm. nelly we need to come up with that branding today on this thing so that we can claim <laughs> okay. it um but yeah so but yeah your, your point is well made look i think that we we've talked about this before too that i think given the um when you work for a software company specifically, you also have uh, a community of people who um, have very niche needs. And so you have a diverse range of needs uh, and you know, software developers specifically in all of my last 15 years of my career have been a very vocal audience and really have been um, great. I mean, I know people sometimes are like, oh, they have a lot to say. And I'm like, well, isn't that good? Like you're getting all, you're gaining more information about what um what will provide them a, a great work experience and so i'm like yeah let them scream at me about one thing while simultaneously i get to take that information in and like make changes on the back end that can really benefit them and their teams and so yeah i think that there there's a lot of opportunity there yeah and it does i love i i was the same as you i really appreciated when people were vocal about the workplace because it showed that not only they cared but they understand that it's for them. They belong inside the workplace. And they should own their own experience mm -hmm. also. But it it has to be acquired because when we go to a restaurant, when we go to a movie theater, when we go to even a show, we're just a spectator. We mm -hmm. don't have influence over the design or the experience. So somehow the office can be maybe the only place where we want a shared collaboration over that experience. Mm -hmm. We design, we taking the burden of like, getting all the assumption and putting out the plan and going forward with the plan because we need to divide the task but it's great that we also in the communication to know that to re to to reiterate that it's for them that's that's really their place where they should find all that they need to have their best like work yeah and look I, let's let's dive into the idea of like data collection as a as an idea if we think about what you're just describing now we have a really passive way of collecting data that doesn't require the bias of like human experience. And so one of the things I would really suggest, and one of the reasons that PagerDuty has made the investment to work with Density so closely is that we understand, or you know, I think that our team really understands the idea that when people do things like employee engagement surveys, um, that there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot that comes with that. They're thinking about other things. They may be uh, focused on certain aspects of that uh, interaction and not others. And even when we have those opportunities to survey people, they often give us they often give us kind of what I call like a, a polite response. They give us these really polite responses because they don't want to offend anybody or they don't really want to say what they mean. But something changes when action speaks, right? And so when we have uh, data that's based on what the actual uh, behaviors of people are and not based on what they say, it really changes the game. And look, we have a long history of getting some of this data. For instance, we know lunchrooms are always going to be busy from 1130 to one in the day or whatever. Like we know some of these things, we know coffee stations are going to be busy at three in the afternoon. Some of those things are more clear than others. But the things that we have really been missing out on are if we create a new type of zone, if we create a uh, you know an open air conference space, are people actually going to use that space? We can get some of that data by you know determining how often the Zoom room was logged into or whatever. Uh, but at the same time, when we really get into was that chair being sat in? Did people actually like those laptop tables? Uh, things like that. Those things become very difficult to understand, and it it 
takes our job away from being um, more art than science and really gives us a, a quantitative way to start making some good decisions and with that, uh, you know, spend our money more wisely. I, I love the point that you brought up because recently I had uh, a leader in my network who said, oh, could you introduce me to density? And I was very intrigued because I knew that leader for a long time was reluctant on getting any data. And, uh, and I said, oh, did you change your mind? And he was like, honestly, like I'm at the point where, you know, in the, in the bathroom stall, you can find the, like three buttons, like red, green. He was like, it's either I do this to get feedback or I do something that is a lot more sleek, that is not disruptive and gives me the data that I need to know mm -hmm. what is sexy, what is attractive, what is not working. And I was like, yes, please install <laughs> great technology rather than the three buttons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, we've been doing the three button method for the last 30 years, right? So now that there's opportunities to not do that, that really becomes the key. Like, how do we actually collect data that's meaningful? And, and I think too, from a, when we get into the design aspects of what we're looking to do, right? Uh, yes, with furniture selection, that some of those things, like that, those are things that really like interest me. Uh, you know, I'm, not, I'm probably not gonna find out if the blue chair gets more people sitting in it than the red chair, but uh, I will find out if people are using the soft seating zones. I will find out if they're using the collaboration zones. I will find out if they're using the training rooms. Um, things like that. And I think that there's also, you know, we, we talk about this a lot in this world, there's these behavioral and psychological things that we're really looking to gain insight into that up until now, we just haven't had the insight. I mean, we, we, we might have opportunities to gain some of it, but really I'm, I'm, that's what I'm really most interested in. Like, how do we really get into the behavioral stuff so that we know what people want or what they're doing uh, when no one's looking? Yeah, exactly. And somehow it is, it is it has a strong impact on the overall strategy like should we look into expanding in the neighborhood should we look at new emerging hubs like atlanta and austin that we talked about what our neighbors are doing how are they doing i know that was something to, that was missing to me before the pandemic uh, on days that were not the peak days i was always curious if my neighbor were finding the same peak days like is it something that is, that is cultural to the place or is it something that is just because of the of my culture or maybe i haven't put emphasis on some days to come mm -hmm, or i haven't mm -hmm. put events there so i think as we collect more data we can also be feel part of an ecosystem where we get access to what's happening around me so i get an idea of like where should i where should my strategy lead me to mm -hmm. yeah i mean the idea of the midweek mountain a term that i did not come up with uh, is one that we've been talking about a lot. And we're actually looking for opportunities to then use that kind of information, you know, like, okay, so what days have the lowest attendance? And then what can we do that's really unique with the space given those? And so specifically here at PagerDuty, we have a .org team that's really focused on our commitment to social impact and our social impact partners. And so one of the things that I'm really pushing for when COVID, uh, we were entering this like phase three COVID protocol for our company, which means we could have outside visitors again. And so I'm really hopeful that we can start to have our kind of nonprofit NGO social impact people come in and use our space. Like we have such an amazing space, like come in, have an event here, have a fundraiser here for all I care, like come in and make use of it and really utilize it. Because once we have the data that says like, oh, uh, we know the office attendance on Fridays is like 10% or sub 10%. Like, let's make use of the space in other unique ways to really benefit um, our partners and community around us as much as we can. Nathan, I think you just, Andrew, our CEO who's on the call, just sent me like a big melting heart because you definitely touch on something that is very tied to Density's mission, which is... Um, stopping kind of the underutilization of buildings and spaces because because of that lack of utilization we just continue building because we think we need more space without knowing that actually we can reuse the same we can share the space to one another we can we can share the space to people in our community to ngo to organizations even to a startup a startup might decide to only meet on fridays and they would rent or sub rent the pager duty office but they believe that kind of the global mission of like trying to make sure we're not like 
taking all the resources of our planet and making sure we're smarter in how mm-hmm. much we build and how much we need. Mm-hmm. And and this is where I think somehow it struck a new chord that workplace people we didn't have to really bear before, which is our responsibility over sustainability. Mm-hmm. Yes. Have you found also that <laughs> that it's becoming more of a focus of your job or was it before? Has it been played out? Yeah, so this has been something I've been focused on for many years in my career. Um, and so I was doing it in the smallest ways uh, early on. And so I was really focused on those kinds of things we think of as like energy and waste management things. But really the things that I've become passionate about over the past couple of years has become much more the kind of embodied carbon of things that we're doing and producing. And so how I became so interested in sustainability was because I was building and I was seeing how much waste was produced in that process. I also saw how willing when people are in the office, how willing they are to treat things like it's not theirs or it's not their problem. Uh, But really the truth is is that these corporations and companies have such a meaningful and uh, magnificent impact on the environment that it was really critical that on a company level where I was doing the most spending of my life, right? The, the spending of millions of dollars in my professional life is nothing compared to what I'm doing at my house. And so it was like, okay, well, how can we start to incorporate really intelligent ideas around sustainability uh, in building? And so, you know, that has led to me getting lead certifications and other things, but the reality is, is that, and, and also consulting with people on sustainability, um, in different ways. But the reality is, is that the way that I find that I have the most impact within my day-to-day job now is really focused on design. And so when I think about that design part, um, I really am able to incorporate that both mat- from a material standpoint, but also from uh, seeing how, you know, how the manufacturers and the vendors that we use, uh, what their behaviors are. And so it's been really interesting, you know, you understand that PagerDuty is a, me- a medium-sized company, right? And so we have people who uh, look to us um, that are smaller, that expect us to have uh, certain behaviors. But the reality is, is that there are much larger companies that we work with, Salesforce being a great example of a company um, that looks to us and say, okay, if you want to work with us, these are our expectations um, of our scope three kind of relationships and what those people and our vendors are going to do. And so that really has a lot of impact and uh, on the behaviors of the company. And look, I'm really excited that PagerDuty is, just like really meaningfully um, beginning their ESG journey. And so we've just had our first round of ESG reports over the last year or so. And we now have a director of ESG internally, um, Ashin. And so I really look forward to working with him. And I, his first day was uh, two weeks ago. And on his first day, I was like, I'm here to help at all costs, like all the time, please bug me. And he was like, the people who volunteer to get bugged, get bugged a lot. And I was like, bring it on, let's go. Uh, But yeah, I mean, I think that it's really important from a workplace perspective for us to be mindful, yes, of the energy stuff, yes, of the waste management stuff. But I think that there are so many other ways um, that we have real impact. And so the ways that I'm really thinking about that today are the embodied carbon of the products that we buy, um, the way that we dispose of things intelligently. Uh, And then also, interestingly, we have become really good at um, recycling our products to other people. So those could be partners or other companies, uh, which is something I had actually never done much of before. But specifically here at PagerDuty, the IT team is has a lot of really great relationships with uh, nonprofit organizations where we give technology. Um, and so a lot of my, in the past, I was e-cycling stuff, but it wasn't actually getting an, a second life. And here it's been interesting to see things getting a second life, including furniture, um, so, you know, if you're an employee of PagerDuty and you're watching this and you need some furniture, hit me up you can talk. <laughs> nice. I, I have to say that I got very inspired by what you said, because a couple of days ago, I was part of a round table that was actually organized by JLL. And there were 20 of us discussing different topics in the industry. And one big question that is very hot is like, is it our role? Is it our goal to bring people back? Like, is it our responsibility that people bring, like, our back to the office? Mm. And I think you just unlock one answer, which is not only the sustainability, which we have to stop building without knowing whether people are coming or not, but also the way we build needs to be smarter. So it Mm -hmm. is our responsibility to know whether people are coming or not. If they're not coming, then 
find a way to release that asset and give it to someone else. Or if they're coming, how do we make sure the construction, the design, the furniture movements are also something that will be better for our planet rather than damaging? And so somehow we do have a goal or a certain res responsibility to know if people are coming and when they're coming, can they use it? Because it has a broader impact. Yeah, look, Nelly, I, I will tell you, this is something I've been thinking about a lot, uh, so much of my time, because the reality is, is that I don't think it's my job to force people back in the office. And I don't want to be the person telling our executive team, like, oh, we should be one of those companies that's requiring people to be in the office two or three days a week. I don't think that that makes us competitive. I don't think that it makes us a workplace of the future. Um, and so what I would rather do is redefine the, the workplace and think far more about how we work than where we work. And so if we are thinking more about how we work than where we work, what I would love to do is I would love for us to go to where people are. And so I'll give you a great example of this. So out of some, some data that we've gotten about where people have moved through the pandemic, right? We did a simple like dot map uh, in Google of all of the addresses to see where people live today, right? Nothing, nothing crazy, no astrophysics required, um, just a Google map. And so we did that. And what we realized was, is that we have recreated hubs, right? That we have these areas where people have moved to um, organically. And so then I've said to, to people within the organization, like, oh, it becomes our responsibility to go to them. And so what we're going to be doing is an experiment, what we're calling spoke events for now. And so I, I hope that we rebrand that as well over time. But for now, it's going to be called spoke events. And what it is, is that we're going to go to places where we have some critical mass. If we have 15 or 20 employees, we're going to go there. We're going to bring some people. We're going to bring some leaders. We're going to bring some HR team. And we're going to break down some of the silos because what happens, of course, in those geographies isn't that there are a bunch of people who are all in the same job there. It's a diverse group of people. And so we're going to go there and we're going to bring things like our social impact team, opportunities to volunteer. And of course, like, you know, a dinner and some happy hours and some things like that to really bring people together and provide an opportunity for some of our culture, and but also some of our uh, company expertise or uh, benefits, things that maybe they don't get naturally because they're not going into an office. So we're going to go there and we're going to do that. And so we have our first one of those coming up. But I really think that that gets to the point of like, I don't want to dictate people coming to the office because I don't think that that benefits us. And secondly, if we redefine the workplace to how we work, not where we work, then we really provide ourselves an opportunity to uh, think creatively, think intelligently about ways to engage with employees and then change the employee experience for people where they want to be. Look, I'll just add one more thing to that. And that's to say that these events also reduce friction for people. One of the things that we've learned is people really want to work from home because um, maybe they have an adult uh, parent they're taking care of. Maybe they have kids that they're taking care of. Maybe they have things that they need to do in their life that don't, um, really allow for them to travel to one of these other cities. Uh, and so I've seen that this is a real opportunity for us to go and engage with people, but not to interfere with that kind of uh, frictionless experience that they're used to having by working from home. I love it. And again, I think you definitely like a forward thinker into the thing that we like, I coined the term pop-up destination workplace because this is what and it's really related really to the spot like it's bringing those destination workplace to people but I think you went even like a step further like I imagine a food truck like a workplace truck where it would be on the go and you would go and people would know it's happening that day and so they will come and interact with like the company in a small scale as you said there might be some leaders or something that they don't know about or some influencers we're starting to see within company like influencers people who naturally gather other people or mm. community builders and so that workplace food truck would be a new asset somehow that will be part of like what we offer as an experience to employees and i love that you already like experimenting with it and i want to i want to hear about it after you do the first one <laughs> I'm, I'm, as a Texan, I love the idea of a food truck. Also, I might just rebrand it the food truck because that sounds way more fun than spoke event. So yeah, we, we can talk about this more later. But yeah, I think that that's, a, that's exactly what we're looking to do. And look, the idea, we did have the conversation about the destination events too, right? Like that was one of the proposed things. And it's interesting that there's a couple of different things that we didn't go that route. But I have to say that one of the things I couldn't help but stop thinking about was the ESG impact of having those destination events. 
too. It's like all of a sudden you're like flying a bunch of people to a place uh, for an event and whatever. And like, I know we all have to fly occasionally. It's part of the deal. But uh, to intentionally um, take on that burden also didn't seem necessary when we have a real opportunity to reduce friction and go to them. But food truck it is. We're going to stick with that. I love it. I think we're at time, but I had such a lot of fun that I would I could continue for another hour. Nathan, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you. And thank you guys. I appreciate all of the help that Density's been providing recently. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, guys. <laughs>